Hey everyone, this episode of the Cloudcast is sponsored by PagerDuty. PagerDuty is the hub of your IT operations and ensures that the right folks are alerted at the right time to increase your uptime. PagerDuty's analytics help you identify common problems, allowing you to make system improvements before they impact your customers. Advanced filters and deduplication ensure that only actionable alerts get delivered. No more false alarms at 2 a.m. And now, multiple team members can seamlessly share on-call duty. To sign up for a free 14-day trial, visit pagerduty.com slash the cloudcast. And now, on to the show. Cloudcast Media presents, from the massive studios in Raleigh, North Carolina, this is the Cloudcast with Aaron Delp and Brian Gracely, bringing you the best of cloud computing from around the world. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are, and welcome to a hopefully much better audio version of the Cloudcast. Uh, Aaron and I are both coming to you live from the massively pollen-crusted Cloudcast studios here in Raleigh, North Carolina. Spring is definitely in the air. Uh, it's in our noses. Aaron, how are you, man? It's good to, good to have you back in Raleigh. Yeah, uh, this is the, one of the first times I think we've both been in Raleigh in, in quite a while. And yes, it, you know, anywhere you go, you got to basically get all the crap off the uh, windshields of the cars before you can drive anywhere because, I mean, everything is just yellow right now, which is fun and sad all at the same time. Yeah, it's the, the circle of life, but it's, yeah, it's the, the one downside of living in the South. So uh, today is going to be a cool show. So, you know, today's going to be an old friend of the show, and we always say we never play favorites, but this one is one of our favorites, really, because the last time he was on, and it's been a long time, I mean, it's been a couple of years now, he really kind of changed our thinking about, you know, making the connection between technology and ecosystems and business and, you know, tying stuff together. So we're really excited to have uh, Sam Ramsey back on the show. Sam, welcome. Thank you so much. It's great to get a chance to chat with you again. So the last time we were talking to you, uh, you were running Apogee, a uh, big uh, API ecosystem company. What are you doing now? Yeah, so I was chief strategy officer at Apogee, and I made the crazy choice to leave um, uh, just before they filed their S1, which they did at the end of March. But the opportunity to move from from a, a strategy leadership role at the leading API platform company to be the CEO of cloudfoundry.org, which is the the open source independent foundation that supports the, uh, the, the growth, contribution, awareness, adoption of the biggest cloud native application platform was too much to pass up. So that's that's what I'm doing, um, and that, that all these changes have happened quite quickly. I took my job formally on January 21st, 2015. Uh, so we've been sprinting ever since then. That was the first board meeting where I was given my job and elected into uh, into office. And since then, just been running hard for the last 10 weeks, uh, building the team, understanding the space, and trying to make sure that everybody who can contribute and use Cloud Foundry is doing so. And And we actually caught you at home today because... So you said it's been 10 weeks or so. I don't know that you've been home in 10 weeks, have you? It, it hasn't been a lot of home time in 10 weeks. Uh, I'll just say my my dog always looks at me like she's never seen me before or else like maybe I died and I've come back and she's a little desperate. So, <laughs> uh, Speaking of pollen on cars, uh, there hasn't been a lot of pollen in my car because it's been in the airport garage, but uh, I'm looking forward to getting the chance to get some pollen on my car too. Yeah, yeah. And and so also for those that are, are maybe newer listeners, the, the connections here is you were on the show with, with Christian Riley and that was, uh, again, agree with Brian, it was one of those – shows that really kind of opened our eyes uh, as far as like APIs and business models. And so I would suggest everyone, you know, it is probably, even though it's a couple years old, still very much worth a listen, go back. And then of course the, the connection there is Christian was our very first guest ever on show number, I think two. Um, so, so it goes, it goes way back here and it's really awesome to really see like your transition over time as, as this, you know, uh, technology has, has transitioned over time as well. So that's awesome. Well, Christian's such a practical, uh, uh, and, and real technology visionary. You don't see those two phrases combined in somebody that often. I think he up levels uh, every conversation he's in. So that was actually one of the most, uh, enjoyable podcasts uh, I've ever done. So I have very warm feelings about that as well. Awesome. So tell us what, 
what is Cloud Foundry these days? Like, let's kind of dig into the current stuff here. Sometimes we hear modern middleware. Other times we hear, you know, platforms for modern apps, advanced container management, lots of kind of buzzwords and phrases thrown around. But give us your take. You know, what what made you make this transition? At its highest level, a Cloud Foundry is a place of practice for continuous innovation. So if I break that out, right, a cloud foundry, kind of turning that into, into a noun, right, the proper noun, it's something that everyone can have, the idea that a cloud foundry is a place where, like a physical foundry or an iron foundry, you're building things of value. That's, that's a lot of what the, the semantic meaning of, uh, of cloud foundry is. The idea that it's a place of practice is deeply pragmatic, the idea that we, we produce products and things that work and, and, and deliver value by getting together day after day together in person, building things, learning how to do it better, learning through error, iterating. And then finally, this idea of continuous innovation. One thing that we've heard from, and Christian Riley was a, a great example of this, turning Bechtel into a place where they could do continuous innovation. What we found is a lot of places of practice where agile software development's being done, trying to deliver new connections, new technologies, new experiences for, for enterprises tend to get bogged down inside existing IT processes, right? You're doing agile uh, inside of a very structured IT push to production process. And so the, the joke there is that that's not really scrum, it's water scrum fall. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, a little painful, right? So, so that's, the, that's the, the big vision, right? That's what a cloud foundry should be because as every company becomes a software company or maybe more specifically than Mark Andreessen had said it, every company is becoming a cloud services and apps company, um, they need this place of practice and they need technology to support it and they also need the wisdom of the community for, for how do you get this done. If we dive down a level, then what is Cloud Foundry the bits? What's Cloud Foundry the open source project that you can find on GitHub slash Cloud Foundry? That is a cloud native application platform. Um, it's the only multi-vendor independent open source project that is a cloud native application platform. And each of those words kind of points back to the, the changes that are, that are going on. Um, the idea of a, of, of a cloud native application is quite different from a traditional application that's being moved to the cloud. Cloud native applications are based on microservices. They use a 12 factor, um, uh, app architecture. They don't believe that they are responsible for storing any persistent data because the way that you think about cloud native applications is they're they're like a herd or a fleet and if any one goes out you just kill it and restart it so you need a different place to have services that provide your persistence that do your messaging that do your analytics all these things that are more durable um, and then this concept of the platform is where we get out of the water scrum fall that happens because you've got a mismatch between your development and your operations so if we start building towards a devops culture in every enterprise. The only way that we can scale that is by giving IT ops a single coherent platform that, that's designed to work, that they can operate without going crazy, uh, that is able to support developers doing not just continuous integration, uh, which is maybe the silver standard of Agile, but doing continuous deployment, right? All the way from, you know, the, you push the button and it's in production and it's live, even if you're walmart.com. That's the gold standard for Agile, and that's what every company needs to get to. So cloud-native application platform, as a phrase, started picking up a lot of momentum in early March at Enterprise Lobby in Hawaii. Adrian Kokrift uh, was talking a lot about cloud-native applications, cloud-native application architectures. Um, the set of people who were there thinking about it said, you know, what, what this really all calls for is a cloud-native application platform. And that's what Cloud Foundry has been built to be over the last couple of years, and is certainly a good definition of the arc of where that project's going over the next couple of years. Nice, yeah. awesome. So, so clear up something for me because I, I, I don't know if I've misunderstood something or if I <clears throat> just heard different things. You know, um, you know, Cloud Foundry the project has has gone through a lot of different iterations. You know, it started as sort of a, a VMware project. It it became more of an open source project. It you know spun out into different things. And then we hear sometimes this talk about like pair programming and dojos and like connect the dots for us is if, if somebody wants to contribute to Cloud Foundry, um, obviously there's the, the, the foundation model. And, but for, for a, an, an everyday programmer that, that goes, hey, there's a thing in there I can contribute, I want to fix. 
is that something they can do or is it does it have to sort of go through the pair programming model and the dojo facilities and all that kind of stuff? That's a great question. So let me start where you started, which is, yes, it was a project. And you can even see on the mailing list VCAP Dev, uh, which I think stood for uh, you know VMware Cloud Application Platform. But nobody calls it that anymore. That was kind of the version one of Cloud Foundry. And then it uh, went into Pivotal. Uh, Pivotal got spun out. You know, it was open source. And then uh, two interesting things happened. One is that it, got, it was taken over by Rob Me. Now, Rob Me may not be a household name yet, but it should be. Rob uh, is one of the best engineers on the planet. He founded Pivotal Labs in 1989, and um, uh, if not the inventor, probably the very best uh, example, uh, you know, exemplar of, pract- of practice of pair programming. Right. So, from 1989 at the foundation of uh, of what became Pivotal Labs, I think the name Pivotal, you know, came out in like '92, and that's been running ever since. That idea of pair programming is two developers, two monitors, two keyboards, two mice, one computer. So you're really almost like flying an F-15. You know, you're constantly piloting and co-piloting. And the experience that Rob and if you talk to anybody who's been at Pivotal or Pivotal clients over the years for Pivotal Labs, it produces better thought out code that works better and also does a better job representing the needs of the user. One of the key tests you have in pair programming is uh, actually not just a technical test, but an empathy test. It is one. It, it seems amazing that you can test for it, and certainly develop. Depending on your experience of being a developer or working with developers, that's maybe not always the strongest suit. So you do end up with this unusual subset of developers who end up doing pair programming, who have high IQ but also have pretty decent EQ to be able to work together to build these things out. So that's kind of unpacking a little bit about where it came from. The next thing that happened was IBM found out about the project and said, you know, we really want to take a dependency on this. We're very excited about it. We want to put it in Bluemix, but we can't do this if this is, you know, single vendor open source where Pivotal has all the developers and controls all of the trademarks uh, and copyrights. Shortly thereafter, HP kind of said the same thing. So this all happened about a year ago. Uh, so the foundation was declared, hey, we need this. We're going to do this started getting built out and accepted. And then just over the last couple of months, as we actually incorporated the foundation and uh, uh, and built out the staff, including Chip Childers, who's our uh, technology chief of staff and really an amazing person. Yeah, we know Chip. Uh, we've tra- transferred all the copyright into the foundation. So now the, the foundation is the legal entity that owns all of the all the intellectual property associated with Cloud Foundry. So that's how it's a, an independent project. Getting to the last part of your question, how do you contribute? You can get on the mailing lists. You can get on VCAP Dev. You can get on the repositories. They're on, as I said, they're on GitHub uh, slash Cloud Foundry. Um, like any open source project, people are going to be interested. They're going to want to send requests, suggestions, file bugs, send pull requests. And those are always going to be probably a bit um, on the tactical side uh, to be a contributor if your pull request is accepted. Um, in order for that to happen, we're going to ask you to sign a contributor license agreement to make sure that that copyright comes back into the foundation and that we can keep the intellectual property set well governed, right? Clean for anybody else who might ultimately want to make this an upstream component of theirs and go and tweak it, commercialize it, whatever. To become a real hardcore committer, to have commit rights and to understand the architecture of this distributed system, by definition, distributed systems are non-trivial, a distributed system as a product that's supposed to land in the data center and scale things up, scale down, manage health, manage monitoring, that's even more non-trivial. So to become a committer, that's where we get into Dojo. So Dojo brings together a few of the concepts that you, uh, that you brought up, including included pair programming and committer status. In Dojo, you would enter a pairing model. You would spend six to eight weeks working with somebody who already has committer status, working on a particular discrete subsystem within Cloud Foundry. And as you go, you're, you're improving the code, delivering against the stories that are in you know, the storybook or the backlog or the icebox as determined by the project lead. At the conclusion of that, you're going to end up with commit rights. So from then on, you can continue to attribute through pair, pair programming. Uh, some projects use a more classic open source model of distributed committer, which is you know, we're all working on things individually and we'll send pull requests. And we've also started to see uh, a lot of adoption of remote pairing. So you could have a pair working 
you know, uh, on site somewhere, and then the rest of the team might maybe three more pairs is on site uh, at, a, at a different location. So those systems can work. What we're trying to do is to make this more transparent, easier to adopt, um, and uh, sort of more obvious. Where do I start? What's the process, and, and how do I conclude it so that we can make it easier for uh, for companies and developers to contribute? Okay, yeah, that make it makes sense, and it it. Um... I, I sort of knew some of the history of the the pivotal pair programming, and then you know I, I've seen announcements of you know different companies opening a dojo, and you know I think EMC's done one, I think IBM has one, and and so I was trying to connect those dots. So that that explains a lot. Thank you for that. Yeah, you're welcome. And the foundation is going to open a dojo as well. So we have just secured a long term lease in some very beautiful space in San Francisco. So we'll be down around Market and Montgomery. And by the summer, uh, we should have a foundation dojo. And that's important because we have to eat our own dog food. We have to have a level of expertise that we can use to on-ramp new members who want to build their own dojos. Um, and then we also want a place that is just by default a good place to be. So it's nice and central. Um, it's near IBM's Blue Mix Garage. Uh, it's near Pivotal Labs. Uh, it's near all of the sort of the startup culture uh, within you know San Francisco, which is sort of financial district and south of market. Um, just an, a generally you know easy place to get to, not far from the airport. So we're trying to make it open and accessible. And strangely enough, this day and age for this project, a open source foundation really has to have a physical presence, uh, an actual place that you can come and, and practice pairing. Cool. Um, so. I, I don't know, Brian, we're, we're testing the microphones, how sensitive they are. I don't, I don't know if you can hear the lightning and thunder at my house, but <laughs> I, I pick it, I pick it up a little bit and I actually think we should leave it in because the last time we, the last time we had a bunch of lightning and thunder, uh, we had Peter Ulander, and it turned out to be a, a very, very good show. So yeah, oh, nice. we'll leave it in. We'll leave yeah, it it's, in. It's, yeah. get, it's getting ready to dump right here, but anyway, to, to <laughs> keep going. Um, so let me ask you this uh, again, step back super, cause I want to dig into the tech in just a second, but I'm sure you get this question at least sometimes of, you know, the the other buzzword that seems to be out there all the time. Like, how does this compare to just straight up containers and, and Docker? And a lot of what you're telling me seems to be the same kind of story about microservices and a lot of these other things that I hear from Docker. Is this complementary? Is it competitive? Is it coopetition? Like, tell me a little bit about that. So from my perspective, it's purely complementary. Um, I have a lot of respect for Solomon Hikes. Uh, strange story. Um, I had a sort of a Forrest Gump moment in late 2009 uh, when I had left Microsoft and came down to San Francisco to work for Apogee. Um, was getting involved in the open source meetup scene in San Francisco. And in this one meetup, uh, I got to meet Adrian Cole, um, Solomon Hikes, um, uh, Lucas Carlson, right, and and a few other people. But but right there, right there, you've got, you know, sort of Doc Cloud and Docker. Uh, you know, you've got... Uh, uh, you've got all the great work that, that Adrian has done with JClouds and beyond. Uh, and then you've got Lucas Carlson, who was building PHP Fog as a project and then taking it all the way forward. Actually, I think uh, I think George was there with Design Cloud as well. It was it was a, just a crazy moment in time to be there. Uh, I ended up being one of the first people to take Solomon to lunch. He was trying to work out his plan for moving from Paris and, you know, doing a real startup in Silicon Valley. So, uh, you know, gave him a little bit of advice early on. Still a big fan of Solomon's. So Docker as a container is a beautiful way to standardize a format for describing what is a, you know, what's a portable, a small portable workload. Portability has got to be one of the core things we care about as we get into the next wave of cloud computing, where we're not just using one big monopoly player and all of their core services with, you know, Amazon and all the new things like SQS, SNS, you know, EMR, all the upper layer services they're offering. We've got to be focusing on portability. Uh, a Docker file is a great portability format for defining, you know, what do I want as a developer in my stack? It's not in and of itself forcing microservices. It doesn't force a 12-factor um, uh, app that is a design pattern you can apply to something that you put inside a container. So where Cloud Foundry and Docker come together is probably best seen through a refactoring we have of the Elastic Runtime. Uh, it's codenamed Diego, D-I-E-G-O. And if you're curious, I can tell you why that's a silly developer pun. But the important part is that Diego can use a classic Cloud Foundry concept called a build pack, which was inherited from Heroku. The idea that you could just have a little bit of code and the build pack would take care of all of the other dependencies, bundling those in and, and making that run. 
And if you have an issue where you need to update the build pack for security reasons, you can update just that and then restart the servers and all those issues are solved. But you can also support uh, Docker and Rocket in that same environment. That's really important. What you find as you step back from containers is that containers are indeed the workload and the opportunity and challenge for improving data center computing is to be able to manage um, really tens of thousands of containers on hundreds of servers. And that really gets into orchestration, management, health checks, uh, systems that make sure that you have a clear desired state for the number of service instances you have, how they relate, how the routing works, how do you do discovery and registration. So containers are sort of, as um, Obi-Wan Kenobi might have said, you know, your first step into a larger world. So, so Diego, to a certain extent, is is kind of doing for the the container infrastructure, if you will, what Solomon talks about sometimes with <clears throat> with Docker, and and I think what he calls it is sort of a pluggable pluggable with batteries included kind of architecture, where it's like we're going to include the things that that'll be there because people want stuff to run out of the box, but if you want to use other things, there there is a pluggable way of doing that. Is that kind of what Diego looks at from a it looks at those different container ways of doing things, and it goes, we're, we're cool with all of those. Um, you know, plug in the one that you like. Absolutely. Right. So um, under, under Diego, you know, um, uh, Docker is important. Uh, you know, Rocket and the file format based on the app container spec is important. Um, also, uh, some other uh, longer-term Cloud Foundry containers uh, called Garden. Uh, and Garden's interesting because um, it supports both Linux and Windows. So, you know, a platform has got to be open beneath and it's got to be clean above. So the surface area that we present to developers programming microservices applications needs to be very clean. Underneath it, we need to be able to just move all of the workload, all the bits, wherever they have to go. And this, the, the, the big challenge in large-scale uh, application and distributed computing is how do you patch the fleet? So containers are a nice, work, uh, a nice way to take care of that as well. Um, and also reduces the number of guarantees that an application expects from the infrastructure. In the old days, an application, to use Craig McLucky's uh, analogy, Craig is the product manager for Kubernetes at Google, he said in the old days, an application was more like a pet, right? What's a pet? Well, it's your dog or it's your cat. It's got a name. If it gets sick, you get very upset. You take it to the vet. You try to figure out how to fix it. Uh, a, a better analogy for what you expect out of containers is more like his analogy is cattle, I'm going to use maybe a fleet of cars, right? If, if, a, if a truck breaks down, your truck doesn't have a name. You don't cry, right? You, you, know, you, you probably just get a new truck and, and get things going back on the road. Um, so how do, you, how, do you, how do you just assume that all these things are ephemeral um, and put the important durable services, right, persistence, messaging, whatever, somewhere else? So that, that's where I think there's, there's harmony in the concepts. Diego goes a little farther than that, which is it includes – um, uh, something called Doppler, which does uh, you know logging and aggregation. It includes a Go router, so it's uh, your ability to find and bind to new services, change those bindings as services become more or less available, and uh, a few other interesting things like the Receptor API and uh, a, a system that I find personally quite clever. Um, and uh, uh, when I came across it and it was being described to me, I thought that's a really nice way to solve this. Uh, a lot of approaches to distributed computing uh, are you know, to say there's a desired state and there's an existing state that's kind of standard. But often you put a controller in place to force the system and to have uh, an innate representation of which server can take which workload and just gets pushed out. They've flipped the model upside down in Diego with a system called an auctioneer. So you put up an auction over a very high-speed messaging bus, and then whichever container managers, whichever gardens want to grab it, can say, oh, uh, pick me. I will take that workload on. And then they know a standard place to, to grab that container um, and go. Or you can put out an auction to say, who wants to kill one instance of this because there's actually less load on our policy says, we only want to have four instances of this running and we've got five. Who wants to let one go? So those are all parts of what, uh, of what Diego does. It's, it's pretty, pretty nice, very elegant. It's a very good refactoring and re-architecture of what was previously the, the droplet execution agent and, uh, and some of the other components around there, including how it works with the router and the cloud controller. Nice. So, Sam, I just have to say this real quick. You're way too technical to be CEO. 
<laughs> I think that I think only a very technical person is going to be able to herd the cats and no, get it as an open source project. So, so let me ask you this. Um, so we, we're talking about a, a bunch of different kind of projects here, and, and there's you know there's Bosch, there's L- Lattice, there's all these others. At kind of you know step back for a second, and and I got to you know know Chip at, when in his CloudStack days. Um, when it comes to like managing all of these different projects, like how do you have these arch- architectural discussions and decisions that you know not to pick on our friends over at the OpenStack Foundation too bad, but how do you keep it from being like eighty thousand projects? One of the ways that we do that is through the the PMC, right through the through the core governance process. How projects get accepted, how many project leads we have, um, uh, what the requirements are, and then how we match, uh, you know, stories and backlogs with engineering talent. Right? How many engineers do we have available? Part of it is that we have a fairly uh, we're still fairly early. Uh, I think in the life of this open source project, it could certainly you know be pressured to turn into eighty thousand projects down the road, but uh, as, as you know, Chip, and of course, you know that Chip is awesome. You also know that he's, he really understands the Apache way. So one of the ways that we think about borrowing from the best ideas, you know, we're part of the Linux Foundation, so we get to borrow a lot of Linux Foundation ideas. The Apache Foundation, Apache Software Foundation, has done a really nice job of staying up to date and also getting new projects in, and also having a high level of quality from top level projects. The PMC model is, is very much patterned after that. The ability to incept new projects has to pass a certain bar, right? It's got to go by the PMC council, which is Rob Me, uh, uh, myself, and a set of uh, top-level project leads, right? The, the the project lead for Bosch, the pl- project lead for, for Runtime, uh, et cetera. We try to be thoughtful about what is really a net new project versus what's a feature on an existing project. And then if it's a feature how do we land that into, into that work stream? And that all goes back to the agile development model of, of stories and backlog. What's probably going to happen in the near future, right, as we see a, a, a wave of upticked contribution from many companies, but, uh, but including SAP, EMC, uh, IBM, uh, Hewlett Packard, uh, and others, uh, you might have noticed recently that Mirantis became a member of the Cloud Foundry Foundation. Um, they'll be making contributions around the Bosch area. So some projects have to get refactored over time. Bosch is certainly a candidate for that, especially because of the number of different things that that maybe need to be done with it. More teams need to work on it. I think as a result of the pairing um, and two pizza team concept behind uh, how Cloud Foundry gets built, those will naturally fracture into multiple sub projects, um, and you'll you'll see where that ends. There's no one good answer, there, and there's certainly no one. Um, you know, architect and, 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 and dictator that says it's all going to be exactly like this. It's more of a emergent process that needs to be driven by customer requirements. And one of the cool things about the foundation is it's not vendor heavy, right? There are some big vendors as platinum sponsors, but we've got 40 members. Um, and the majority of them are, you know, end users. Um, we're coming out with some announcements, uh, you know, very soon, but, you know, we already have uh, a number you can see on the site uh, that are that are end users of it. Their input is considered to be primary for what do we need to bring in. So far, that's mostly been uh, new features uh, and fixes in existing projects, but it has also been the cause of uh, of brand new projects. Yeah. So <clears throat> let me let me shift gears a little bit. Uh, kind of kind of talk to the other side of your of your CEO title. How do you how do you look at the the sort of marketplace goals of of you know, what you guys build in, in cloudfoundry.org, you know, obviously you've got, like you said, you've got sort of vendor side people on the board, but at the same time, you've got, you know, service providers and, and other companies that, you know, have, have different ideas of, of what could come out of this. How, how do you guys from a cloudfoundry.org perspective, think about what to do in the marketplace, how to grow the marketplace, how to message things in the marketplace? Mm-hmm. It's a great question. So we think of Cloud Foundry as having an economy, and we think of ourselves as being the governors of that economy. Um, if we're governing well, the economy gets bigger. If we're governing, governing poorly, then it gets smaller. So i um, very grateful for the support of um, an incredibly smart person, Marshall Van Alsten, 
Uh, he's a professor at Boston University, um, has his PhD in econ from MIT. He's also part of the MIT Center for Digital Business. Uh, I had the opportunity to start working with him a few years ago uh, while at Apogee because he's one of the world experts on platform economics. How is it that technology platforms and business model platforms come together? How do they work effectively? How do they distribute wealth? How do they encourage sustainable commercial investment um, and, and outcomes while not having a, uh, uh, as he would say, a monopoly is a market failure, right? Without having a, a, a broken model where you're getting uh, inappropriate distribution of, of wealth. So that's, that's sort of the, the top level perspective is that we are, we are governing, governing an economy. And if you look at our, our job recs, you'll see that, strangely enough, one of the first, uh, one of the first eight people uh, that we're hiring is an economist because we need to be able to understand the reach and the measure. We're running global uh, polls to understand where uh, cloud foundry opportunities. And then we can turn that information around to our members so they can say, well, for the particular type of buyer, right, size of company and region – uh, this is a good part of the world for me to focus my efforts on. This is where we should do marketing and outreach. It's also a really important aspect of governance to be a market maker. So what is Cloud Foundry? That kind of sounds like a philosophical question, but it needs to be answered by a certification. If it's certified, then it should be allowed to use our trademark. If it's not certified, it should not. So the lens that we're applying to certification is our promise, right? our vision, is to create a ubiquitous uh, set of cloud foundries that give you portability and interoperability to enable a vibrant and growing ISV and developer ecosystem. What's going to hurt cloud foundry would be if we don't govern that well and apply the mark. So you've got lots and lots of different things calling themselves cloud foundry, but you can't pick up an app that's running on one cloud foundry and run it on another. Um, that will be That will be a failure. What's going to work really well is if we're clear on training and, uh, and certification of, of individual people and that we can be rigorous about the technical certification of apps and services that are compatible with Cloud Foundry or that represent Cloud Foundry distributions like IBM Bluemix or P Pivotal Cloud Foundry or HP Helion uh, or Active State Staccato. How do we make sure that those things all deliver on this interoperability and portability promise? Because that's what creates large scale markets. Hmm, that's interesting. And to take that kind of market and marketplace concept a little bit further. Um, so you've built a lot of both developer communities and kind of ecosystems before. Is there a kind of a, a, a certain app type or a domain that you're specifically focused on in growing that market or marketplace? Or do you think like this type of app will, will potentially grow faster than others? Or, you know, tell us a little bit about applications and, and business problems you are trying to solve here. Yeah. So our job is to not be the smartest people in the room, right? But to be the world, let the world be the computer, right? The world has to come up with the solution to that. So what we have to do is act with maximum leverage. If you look at our uh, our investors, right? If you look at the, the members of the foundation, uh, you know, the market cap's in excess of a trillion dollars. So you're looking at very, very large companies with very well established channels, routes to market, uh, you know, professional services groups and big partner programs. The first step that we have to get right is the platform, right? Cloud Foundry as a cloud native application platform ha has to have a high level of awareness in those partner channels and then it can be adopted. Uh, the range of apps is mind-boggling. So let's take one of our members, EMC. EMC, huge corporation, right? Twenty plus billion dollar revenue. They also have Documentum. It's an EMC app. That's a pretty complex cloud-based distributed system that does a lot of different things about document and content management, rights, auditing, all that stuff. That's actually now shipping as a Cloud Foundry app. You look at SAP. And the HANA Cloud Platform and new business apps that, that SAP is building, those are running on Cloud Foundry as well. So taking the right set of members, and again, if you add to that IBM, HP, right, we're talking about uh, pretty enormous companies with big you know, partner events, um, partner channels, incentives for participating. Uh, we're getting pretty close to being able to support Cloud Foundry on Azure. Of course, Microsoft has major uh, you know, partner presence and incentives for new developers, existing developers to run apps on Azure. If they're running on Cloud Foundry on Azure, they're just as um, 
eligible for the incentives uh, as anyone else. So our opportunity is to make sure that we are orchestrating the ecosystem very thoughtfully through these enormous software companies and turning them into channels for their own benefit and for the benefit of each of their partners to take Cloud Foundry through. All of that pressure will continue to make Cloud Foundry better. We have the privilege of working with some really, really big ISVs who put tremendous pressure on Cloud Foundry over the last couple of years to make it better for them um, and then get that out there. So that's sort of the first big uh, picture answer, which is we need to be a global platform. Underneath that, I'm really, really curious about a few particular areas, right? So as we as we follow that idea of of ecosystems, we start looking at what are you know what do industry ecosystems look like? GE has built uh, something called Predix, P E R E D I X, which is an industrial internet cloud service. So what does that do? You manage heavy industry, big equipment, engines, take data feeds off of them, and then do predictive maintenance. That's all running on Cloud Foundry. So it makes sense, and it's something that I was watching for the last couple of years at Apogee, it makes sense that there are going to be a set of industry-specific clouds. Those are probably not going to be run by Amazon or Microsoft because uh, technology companies tend to build purely horizontal things. Big players that can also make big IT investments in specific industries are going to make industry-specific cloud services. So I think Internet of Things is interesting. Intel's got a big play there, could end up being a, a, a living cloud platform for that. GE on the industrial internet side, um, the financial services, right? We're seeing some very interesting things coming out of, uh, out of Wall Street groups. Uh, there will probably just be room for a couple of platforms per industry. And I think there will be at least one for every single industry. And there are, you know, um, there, are, there are many dozens of standard industry codes. Uh, and I think each of them is probably going to have a cluster around sharing uh, data and a particular set of application workloads through uh, through a platform. Uh, our job is to make sure that there are working groups to support each of the, those industries, so we can make sure that Cloud Foundry is a good place for that to land. Nice. <clears throat> yeah, no, it's it's interesting. <laughs> our, our industry is always funny because it's it's uh, a lot of the ideas come back again. Um, it sometimes you've got to fix the bandwidth of the CPU or the cost, and, and the ideas work at a later point. I mean, we. You know, in the in the mid '90s, we had the the automotive cloud that was going to get built between the big three. You've forever had talk about you know the healthcare cloud and the various you know university clouds. So, but it's interesting. You've you've now got you know open source, which allows them to customize things. You've got you know public cloud services, which takes away the the capital investment. So it's it's interesting that those ideas are coming back around because the the economics work for them now, uh, right. where maybe they didn't before. That is so well said. So many of the things that we saw in the 90s and even in the early 2000s and believed, you know, ambitiously and optimistically were possible. Um, they really were the right ideas. But as you said, we just didn't have all of the pieces of the infrastructure to support it um, at the cost that it needed to be in order for those things to really happen. Right. One of the things that makes me so ambitious and optimistic about Cloud Foundry is that I think that this is at the correct abstraction layer. When you look at what developers and corporations can and can't handle, um, the closer you get to the user and the application, the easier it is for everyone to think about and adopt, right? You think about Windows uh, on the desktop. Um, the more, the closer it is to the infrastructure, right? So looking at, uh, you know, technologies like SoftLayer and OpenStack, right? The, the number of application developers or business people who can even understand it, let alone care about it, ends up being fairly restricted. So being able to talk to uh, these these major industry players about an application platform for cloud native apps that'll let them get things done much faster, build new partnerships, share data more effectively. You have standing in that conversation from the beginning with a lot of people, even over to the line of business, right? Business people care about agility and they understand platforms. They're used to buying marketing platforms. They're used to buying selling platforms. The idea that there'd be a, an agility platform or an app platform uh, for, for digital business, that kind of just makes sense to them. Yep. That oh, makes, makes sense. Aaron, I, I, think, I think once again, Sam has, uh, has sort of overloaded our brains and uh, given, us <laughs> a lot to, given us a lot to think about. No, it's, it's been fantastic. And, and like, like Aaron said, it's, uh, it's, it's always amazing to us that, that you can go as deep as you go in the technology and then flip the switch and start talking about, you know, global economics and, and how to influence industry. So, uh, so with that, you know, thank you so much once again for, for coming and talking to us. Um, you know, you talked about traveling all over the place. Where can people 
find you if they want to pick your brain on stuff or send the you know cloudfoundry.org group a suggestion or something? What's the best way to engage you guys? Well, you can always get me at S Ramsey on Twitter. Um, you can also find me S Ramsey at cloudfoundry.org. Um, always a good place to come in if you're if you're technology centric and your questions much more on a on a technological or project bent than you want to hit Chip Childers. That's C Childers at cloudfoundry.org. And our promise to you is we'll you know we'll turn we'll turn those around and put them in the right places as fast as possible. Keep you in the loop and be transparent because ultimately our success or failure is going to be determined by how fast our community grows, how much trust and goodwill we can generate. So that's what we're trying to do. So the more input we get, the better we can serve you. And I just wanted to add another one as well. Uh, next month is Cloud Foundry Summit in Santa Clara, May 11th and 12th, and. The Cloudcast is actually kind of the official podcast of Cloud Foundry Summit, and we're going to be out there doing shows and talking to people. And so if this of of interest to you, we're going to actually have uh, quite a few more shows coming to you kind of, you know, live-ish from the event. So this is going to be huge. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, it is May 11th and 12th in Santa Clara. Um, the event is going to have some awesome uh, what I'd call nerd culture speakers. Uh, we have uh, uh, Christine McKinley, who's a physicist and a rock star. Um, we have Andy Weir, a uh, space nerd and author of The Martian. Uh, the Martian is now uh, uh, being made into a, mo- a, a movie. Yeah, with, fantastic um, book. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty excited about that. I, I can't uh, wait. Andy, Andy's an old friend, so it's great to see him uh, succeed here. So, um, you know, Matt Damon is going to be starring as Mark Watney, which is pretty exciting. And we have uh, our, our footnote, uh, uh, which is sort of the last keynote of the show, is Cory Doctorow, which is going to be completely uh, crazy and amazing. And then within that, um, we have a lot of conversations that are focused on either A or B. A is you're a customer. You have used this. You've seen the good parts. You've seen the warts. You talk about that. So that's that's going to be a great place to to connect around real world applications of Cloud Foundry. What can we learn? You know, what are the what are the business outcomes? The other half is going to be technology tracks of everybody from the community talking about what have they built, what's on the roadmap, and we have every project lead and architect from the Cloud Foundry project will also be there having open house. An open house is going to be a fairly free flowing open space format. Talk about what's on the roadmap, take input, learn how to become a contributor. So this is this is really going to be a, a, a tremendously, I think, energizing event. We've got good food, good uh, good fun. And on Monday night, my the thing I'm looking forward to most is we're going to have a board game night. Um, we were going to try to get some Dungeons and Dragons in, but that's a little too complicated. We'll have lots of Catan uh, and um, maybe some cards against DevOps. Nice. Awesome. And uh, let me make you an offer right now, which is we'll, we'll create a Cloudcast uh, uh, VIP code for uh, for discounted uh, Cloud Foundry Summit tickets. So hopefully um, we'll, uh, you'll be able to see those attached to this podcast, and you can thank your hosts, Brian and Aaron, for that. Thank you. Cool. Awesome. Very cool. Well, listen, Aaron, I think uh, the lights are the lights are flickering here. I'm hearing some more thunder. We may want to wrap this up before yeah, everything shuts I think, down. I so. think both of us are about to lose power any second now. So we'll, we'll wrap this up. We are out of time for this week. Uh, thanks for listening, everybody. You can follow us on Twitter at the Cloudcast Net, or you can reach us on the web at thecloudcast.net, where you can find links to everything related to the show, including our YouTube channel um, and links to all of the previous podcasts, including Sam. So I recommend, again, go back and listen to it. Uh, once again, on behalf of Sam and Brian, uh, thank you for listening, everybody, and we'll talk to you next week. Bye.